Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much for having invited me. I really appreciate and admire this initiative, which is not very often done. So I think you should be very thankful to the people who have had this idea and they are working to organize it. Unfortunately, the time I have is very short. So I will have to be very quick and I will be unable to explain in detail all the issues, but I hope anyway to give you some idea. The importance of the topic comes from the fact that nowadays in economics fundamentally there are two main approaches to income distribution, employment and growth, which are deeply different and one of the two is often not taught at all, although there are excellent scientific reasons for considering it preferable to the one which is taught, which is the neoclassical. This other approach, which in my opinion is stronger scientifically, is the classical or surplus approach, which is the one of not only Karl Marx, but also Ricardo and Adam Smith, an author normally considered to have founded, uh, created the idea of the invisible hand. But Adam Smith, if you read what he has to say, for example, on the labor market, you will discover he sounds extremely Marxist which is a way to say that Marx was not inventing too much. He was simply inheriting an approach which was much older than he, the approach born with the, physio with the physiocrats, and then Adam Smith, and then Ricardo, and he was simply developing the implications in it. If we had time, I would show you a quotation from an author of Scrope, who in 1831 says that Ricardo's opinions, not Marx, 1831, this is much before, Marx, Ricardo's opinions were a crime because they destroyed the, the connections between classes showing that every class has interests which are opposed to those of every other class. In this uh, approach, the called nowadays often surplus but also classical approach, income distribution is determined by class conflict, by the relative bargaining power of workers and uh, capitalists. I will leave aside in my discussion what determines land rent because land rent is less important as a way to highlight the difference between this approach and the one, the new classical one. <clears throat> and the important thing is that this approach, the classical approach, does not use uh, factor demand function. Wages are determined by processes which one might consider somewhat similar to the ones you might observe working in a, uh, an institution used, to, used often to give an idea of the neoclassical approach. Have you ever heard neoclassical theory applied to the so-called prisoners of war camp? A camp of prisoners of war who have to exchange cigarettes versus soap and you have a pure exchange economy? Now, imagine that in this situation, a group of people forms a gang. Forms a gang and starts terrorizing the other prisoners and starting extracting from them part of what they get in their weekly allowance. What would determine how much they are able to get from the other ones? According to the surplus approach, the situation in capitalism in the conflict between workers and capitalists is not so different. The capitalists have the power to exclude workers from the possibility to produce because capitalists control means of production. Unless you go and work for a capitalist, you cannot get subsistence. And so you have a class conflict and this determines things. Now, to understand where capital theory allows us to discriminate with, between these two approaches and to conclude that the surplus approach is logically stronger, we have to understand a notion which you all have studied in your microeconomic courses, but possibly without grasping all its implications. The notion of long period price. You all have studied the Marshallian partial equilibrium theory, which says that in the long period, the price of a product tends to minimum average cost. Right? You all have studied that. The supply curve shifts, 
and the short period supply curve shifts, and so the long period supply curve is horizontal, right? You remember this? Okay. Now, there is a weakness in this analysis, which is never mentioned. This analysis requires the costs of the inputs to be given, because the minimum average cost must be given independently of the price of the product. It's the given minimum average cost that allows you to argue there would be a gravitation, output of the industry will change, and this would cause the price to tend to minimum average cost. But do we have the right to take the costs of inputs as given? Consider, for example, steel, acai. Steel is made with, among its inputs, machines made of steel. So, how can we know the cost of these machines before we have determined the price of steel? You see, if you allow time for steel to reach its minimum average cost, during this time, all other products too will be changing, uh, will be tending to a price equal to minimum average cost. So, when you want to determine the minimum average cost of steel, which includes capital goods, among its inputs, you must also determine the minimum average cost of these capital goods. And this you cannot do if you already, if you have not yet determined the price of steel. So how do you solve this problem? Through a simultaneous determination of all output prices. And for this I have to jump to, we'll get there, okay. Here you have the simplest example of a simultaneous determination of the prices of two goods which are also capital goods. Good one and good two. I am taking the methods of production as given, in other words, the technical coefficients, which are the minimum amounts of inputs needed to produce one unit of the good. I'm taking them as given, and they are A11, A21. A21 would be the quantity of good two, required to produce one unit of good one. Now, these equations, uh, which I think it's a scandal that they are not taught to in first course economics, tell us that the price of each good must, in the long run, be equal to its minimum average cost. Some problems? Sorry, we want to raise that volume. Just mm. It's not loud enough? Well, I can just talk closer to them, okay? Mm, okay. Now, you see... No, what is this? No, I'm pushing too many buttons. Okay. Price, price of good one equal to wages. This is the technical coefficient of labor. Plus the quantity of good one and quantity of good two to be used as inputs. I'm assuming production takes one period and uh, all capital goods are circulating capital goods, i.e. they last just one cell production cycle, like seed. The simplest example is seed used to produce corn. It disappears in production and so it will disappear completely. And then on the costs of these inputs, where is the yeah, you have to apply a rate of interest. Why? Because if the firm buys these inputs at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year it must pay the interest on the capital that it borrowed to buy them. And even if it doesn't borrow capital, it will pay at the end of the year uh, the rentals for these capital goods. But the people who gave these goods, uh, lent these goods to the firm, will want to be paid an interest on what they had to pay to buy them. So in either case, whether it's the firm that buys these goods, or whether it's people who buy the goods and then lend them to the firm and are paid one year later, the price at which these goods are bought will have to include a rate of interest. So you see, you have two equations, plus an equation which choose the choice of numerator, three equations for the four variables, P1, P2, R, the rate of interest, and W, the wage. So it's enough that something like, for example, class conflict determines the real wage, or that the central bank determines the rate of interest, and you can determine income distribution. So the classical difficulty, which you may have heard of, that the labor theory
is surrounded. And this has been the big innovation of Rafa. And there is no problem generalizing the thing to more goods because if you have one more good, you also have one more equation. So you have one more equation, one more price, and the really, you always have only really one more unknown than variables. So, what is the big difference with the neoclassical approach? For that, we can go back. Sorry, I, I have to go in this way because I had to remain within 45 minutes, and that's very difficult. These slides have taken an hour and a half for a careful presentation. Okay. This is the neoclassical approach that this you all know. On the, on the right hand side you see a decreasing demand curve for labor which corresponds to the marginal product of labor. For simplicity you can imagine an economy producing only corn with corn as capital as end labor. And as I have written, if one factor earns its marginal product, the residue going to the other factor corresponds to its marginal product. So capital two earns its marginal product. And the equilibrium is guaranteed, at least so I in the neoclassicals, by the fact that when all factor employments but one are given, for the last factor you can build a decreasing demand curve derived from its decreasing marginal product and also from uh, consumer choice. The um, approach can argue that it is plausible, extremely plausible, because these decreasing demand curves for factors, which guarantee, or so in the classical argument, the stability of equilibrium, i.e. the tendency to equilibrium, these are derived simply from two things which no doubt exist in reality. Choice by firms between different methods of production, and choice by consumers between different bundles of power consumption goods. So from these things, simply, these demand curves are derived, and so apparently, uh, the classical can argue, there is a clear step forward relative to the classical or service approach, because the classics have not realized the existence of these substitution mechanisms. <coughs> and the view of capitalism which emerges from this approach is very rosy, because it's very difficult to argue that the labor is exploited, because what is the wage? The wage is the marginal product of labor. But this means that if one laborer decides not to work anymore, what does society lose? Its marginal product. And how much was the laborer being paid? Its marginal product. So, contribution to society equals reward. And the same can be argued for capitalists, because capital exists because savers save. They do not consume capital they renounce immediate consumption. And so their sacrifice of abstinence allows capital to exist, and capital gets its marginal product. And so the sacrifice of abstinence gets its marginal product. Everybody gets the marginal product of the factors they own. Uh, you can criticize something, but the criticisms are not immediately evident. It's very strong. There seems to be great equity no, one gives and one gets back what one gives. Uh, but which approach then is correct? I will argue the neoclassical approach encounters insurmountable problems in its treatment of capital. Empirics already suggest there must be something wrong with the approach because the tendency to full employment is not there. And capitalism means big crises. But we can go to the theoretical criticism, which can distinguish two points, a demand side, a supply side and a demand side problem with capital. Let's see briefly this supply side problem. We have to understand what are the data from which neoclassical theory starts to determine equilibrium. These are preferences, methods of production or techniques, and endowments. The problem here arises with specifying the endowment of capital. To understand this problem, let's first of all be clear about the role of equilibrium in the marginal approach. This role is of being a center of gravitation, in the sense that the economy obviously does not reach equilibrium instantaneously, but through correction of errors, 
collection of properties produced, etc., uh, tends the classical hierarchy towards this equilibrium between supply and demand on all the markets. But for this uh, equilibrium to have this role, the equilibrium must stay there while the economy tries to approach it. So the data of this equilibrium must be persistent. Sufficiently persistent that you can argue, well, while this equilibrium is going on, the equilibrium is still there. The equilibrium is not affected by the disequilibrium, otherwise, you would lose all capacity of indicating where the economy is going. <coughs> but if the equilibrium must have this role, then the data cannot include the endowment of each capital good, because capital goods are. Uh, very flexible, very valuable in their endowment. For example, suppose wages decrease because there has been immigration and we want to determine the new equilibrium. These decreasing wages will change firms' choices, will change prices, will change consumer choices, so quantities produced will change drastically and therefore the inputs required to produce them will change drastically. So after very little time, the capital goods existing in the economy will have changed because firms want different capital goods. Okay? So you cannot take as a given to determine the equilibrium the quantity in existence of bricks, of gasoline, of nails, of paint. All these things will be changed during the tendency of equilibrium. <clears throat> the traditional way to surmount this problem within the neoclassical approach was to conceive capital as a single factor, a factor capable of changing composition, changing form, without changing in quantity. The basic idea was, what is given is the value of capital that each person owns. But the person, uh, because capital goods are being consumed, this person sets aside depreciation of this, depreciation of money. And if the person can choose whether to use this money to buy the same capital goods or to buy other capital goods. If the person decides that the old capital goods are no longer the most convenient ones, the person will use the depreciation funds to buy other capital goods. And so the resources which might have reproduced the used up capital goods are used to produce other capital goods, which Vixel, for example, in his first book said, will have the same value. Why? Because they, they are produced by the resources which might have produced the other capital goods. So capital does not change in value, but it can change in its composition. And this was the way to have a given endowment of capital, but to allow the endowments of the single capital goods not to be given, but on the contrary, to be determined by the equilibrium as indispensable. Okay? The problem is, how shall we measure this quantity of capital? There is a logical necessity. It must be an amount of exchange value. The point is simple. All units of the factor must earn the same. So, for example, as I've written here, if you found two different surfaces of land of the same quality, the surface A, a field A, and a field B, and you found out that field A earns twice as much as field B, you would have the right to conclude field A has twice the surface. It must have twice as many units of land in it, otherwise it wouldn't earn twice as much. Clear that? Okay. Now, apply the same reasoning to different capital goods under the assumption that these different capital goods embody different quantities of a single factor. So you have two different capital goods, and one is earning 10, and the other one is earning 5 as net earnings. Okay? You must conclude the first capital good earns, includes more units of capital than the other one, twice as many. Same reason. Okay? But what capital goods earn uh, is the rate is interest, and the rate of interest is the same rate on all capital. So if a capital good earns twice as much as another capital good, it will also have a value which is twice as much. So you see, the logic obliges you to conclude, since 
capital goods earn on the basis of the amount of this hypothetical factor they embody capital, the quantity of this capital must be measured by the value of the capital goods. And then you have the circularity, the reason. Because then, if you want to determine the endowment of capital of an economy, you must look at the value of the capital goods in this economy. But this value depends on prices. When prices change, the value of capital goods changes. So how can you consider the value of capital goods as given for an equilibrium which must determine prices? You have no right to. So here you have an enormous, big logical hole in this theory. And this was pointed out by him, was admitted even by a very honest neoclassical economist, Mixell. Please read with me this quotation from Mixell. But it would clearly be meaningless, if not altogether inconceivable, to maintain that the amount of capital is already fixed before equilibrium between production and consumption has been achieved. Whether expressed in terms of one or the other, a change in the relative exchange value of two commodities would give rise to change in the value of capital. If you go and read Ixell's lectures, you will find this very clearly said. And a few lines later, Ixell says, this implies an indeterminateness of the endowment of capital. But this means you cannot determine equilibrium. This means the theory is empty. The theory is wrong. We need another theory to understand what determines income distribution. Well, of course, uh, the neoclassicals have tried to defend themselves. And how? They've said, OK, let's take as given the endowment of each capital good. Well, this is precisely what I said. It's incompatible with the role of equilibrium as a center of gravitation. Well, they said, well, uh, let's do it anyway. And how did they defend this thing? Well, let's suppose that the adjustments to equilibrium are done by the famous auctioneer. You all have heard about the auctioneer, right? What does the auctioneer do? Establishes equilibrium instantaneously. Because it stops everything, right? And then it allows equilibrium to start, to production and exchange to start only when equilibrium has been reached. And this goes on in so-called logical time, outside real time. In other words, equilibrium is established instantaneously. This is nonsense, of course. Think of all the time required for all the adjustments. For example, let's go back to the wage increase because there's been immigration, all the changes in quantities produced, in methods of production, the firms, etc., etc. Do you think that can be something instantaneous? Of course not. So here we have a case in which any realistic adjustment changes the data of this time of equilibrium. Not the old neoclassical equilibrium which had capital the single factor, but that has the other logical problem I have just pointed out. But this new version has this other problem. It is equilibrium changed equilibrium. And so you no longer know where the economy is going. You cannot conclude to anything, because you simply do not know what's happening in real disequilibrium. And it's not only the endowments of capital goods that change, also expectations can change from one day to the other. And how is this second problem surmounted, so-called surmounted? By assuming, as you all have studied or are going to study in growth theory, uh, taught also by Professor Monet, etc., etc., it's what you assume is a Ramsey path in which there is perfect foresight of the future evolution of the economy. Now, let me ask you, how can there be perfect foresight? Do you know? In reality, there are things which are called novelties. New ideas. Jobs. Steve Jobs had lots of new ideas. Technical progress. These things are logically unpredictable. Logically, if they were predictable, they would be invented or discovered now and not in the future. So, perfect foresight is absurd. It's nonsense. These are two tricks of showing perfect foresight to cover the basic mistake which is that one can take as given to determine equilibrium data which have no persistence, like the numbers of capital goods or, or expectations. I still have some time. <laughs> um, but now, 
Let me give you an illustration of this supply-side problem for the dissemination of the labor demand curve, especially in macroeconomics. You all have studied there is a labor demand curve. In order to increase employment, labor must decrease. But a demand curve for a factor requires full employment of other factors. Otherwise, you cannot determine the marginal product of a factor unless the demand is employed of other factors like you. Then, the labor demand curve requires the full employment of capital. And how are we going to specify this endowment of capital which is fully employed? We cannot specify it as an amount of value, because that is indeterminable, even if we admitted it. We cannot specify it as a given vector of the several endowments of capital goods, because they are going to change during any disequilibrium. So, we have no basis to determine the labor demand curve is a bogus notion. But without the labor demand curve, we have no intersection with the labor supply curve, and therefore we have no equilibrium, which we need, indispensably, we need a different theory of wages. And this is the supply side. We are not finished. It's the demand side problems of the theory also. These, through study of those equations which I have pointed out briefly before, the equations which determine long period prices, have shown that demand for capital is not well behaved. In other words, it's not true that the demand for value capital decreases when the price of capital goes up, or increases when the demand for price of capital goes down. Now, these studies have based themselves on long period prices, and the choice of technique connected with long period prices. But these are important prices. Investment, for example, is based on expected returns over many years. So when in deciding investment, firms count on norm prices being the usual, the average thing they're going to get in the future. So to understand whether they find it convenient or not to invest, we have to study norm prices. So let's do that. Importantly, for the classical theory, in order to have a tendency toward full employment, investment must adjust to full employment savings, otherwise demand curves for factors don't work. Let's briefly remember why. I suppose you know this, but anyway, for macro economics, and let's see. Suppose labor unemployment, wages decrease. Suppose then firms hire more workers, expecting to be able to sell more, because the wage now is below the value of marginal product. Then production increases. Incomes savings then increase. And therefore, in order to sell the increased production without losses, investment must increase to make up for the gap between production and purchases for consumption. The increasing labor demand caused according to the classical approach by lower wages means that investment increases or it will come out to have been a mistake and will be undone. So it's fundamental for this deal to provide the investment that just to say it. How? Well, the rate of interest is the price, which is supposed to do the job. And there are many, several problems on whether the rate of interest will change or not, but we'll leave that aside. Let's suppose the rate of interest increases. Will investment increase? The new classifiers argue yes. Why? Because investment is the value of the purchases of capital goods. By firms that aim to reach the desired stock of capital. Now, the argument of neoclassical is when the rate of interest goes down, firms want to employ more capital, and therefore they will invest more. So the fundamental thing is when the rate of interest goes down, the desired capital labor ratio rises. Firms want to use more capital relative to labor. But as I said, okay, we have to look at long period technical choices. This already I have explained. But now let's see the result of the graph. Assume many goods. I have not, I've spoken less than 30 minutes yet. Is that so? A little less than 30 minutes. So, well, very good time. Okay, so assume many goods and ask how the price of the good relative to good one, relative to numerator, relative in fact to any other 
vary with changes in income distribution for the moment assuming technical coefficients are given. Okay? Then in neoclassical theory we introduce factor substitution. But first we need to understand what happens if technical coefficients are given. If capital could be treated in the same way as you treat labor or land as a technical factor, then once production methods are given, capital, as capital becomes more expensive, the good produced with the higher capital to labor ratio must become relatively more expensive. Suppose you have two goods. One uses very little capital and lots of labor. The other one, lots of capital and very little labor. You raise the price of capital. Clearly, the second good, lots of capital and very little labor, is going to increase in cost much more than the first good. So, because price tends to, uh, to cost, the second good will become more expensive than the first. And this is monotonic. The more the price of capital rises, the more the second good will become more expensive relative to the first one. This is if capital could be treated like labor or land. What Rafa has shown is this does not happen, and this means capital cannot be so treated. Let's see the next slide, and then we go back to the end of the first one. This is a graph you find in Rafa's famous book, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. On the horizontal axis, you have the rate of interest, rate of profit, but it's the same thing. On the vertical axis, you have the difference between the price of two goods, good A and good B. It's price of good A minus price of good B. So, as R starts from zero, where these two goods cost the same, this difference increases. This means that good B is becoming more and more cheap relative to good A, because the, di the difference is positive and is increasing. But at a certain point, the thing changes, and good B starts becoming more expensive relative to good A. At a certain point, it again costs the same, and now it's good A which costs less than good B. And then the thing changes again. So, what does Zrafa say? last part of this slide, the reversals in the direction of the movement of relative prices in the face of unchanged mass of production cannot be reconciled with any notion of capital as a measurable quantity independent of distribution and prices. In other words, this notion of capital that they teach you in nearly all your courses, labor and capital, huh? This notion of capital you take it and you throw it over. It's totally wrong. And it's a crime that they, that they don't tell you. Anyway, <clears throat> so this shows that the capital labor ratio of the production of the good is not given independently of income distribution. Now, this confirms the absurdity of treating the total endowment of capital. Why? This is a point seldom noticed, so I will be very quick on it. If we could establish the capital labor ratio in each industry, then by looking at the dimensions of the several industries, we could understand how much capital is being employed by each industry. And then we could sum up and say this is the endowment of capital of the economy. But Rafa's result shows that you cannot know the capital labor ratio, independently of what then you should determine with it, which is the so you cannot know how much capital is being employed by each industry independently of what the equilibrium should determine. So you cannot do that aggregation. You do not know how much capital there is in the economy. But this is only, the, again, the supply side. Now let's look at the demand side. We have to look at the implication of this result for the changes of the capital labor ratio when, uh, when the rate of interest rises and now we admit technical substitution. I like this one. This is my first episode in which I've used PowerPoint with these animations. I am, you know, very much a stone age in uh, any connected computers, but that does not necessarily affect my arguments. So, let's do this. I showed before, when I illustrated to you those two equations which determine normal prices, that you can, there was a little drawing that I forgot to use. You can derive from it a relationship between the real wage and the rate of interest. Because I said there's only one degree of freedom. So, if, for example, if you 
treat R as a parameter, you change it, for each R you derive the real image, and then you can draw this curve. And this is one example. This is one example, and we'll see a few more next slides. Now, once you have given technical coefficients and you derive the wage curve, you can derive the value capital for units of labor from it in a rather simple way. Suppose that the economy produces only one good as net product. Or you can consider simply the, the part of the economy that is producing a certain good as net product. Choose that good as the number n. Call y the quantity produced of this good. Because this is the net product and you are choosing it as numeric, this is also the value of the net product. Per unit of labor. So, what does it mean per unit of labor? Well, you can always choose the units in which you measure labor. And for example, you can decide, okay, I will consider the whole labor produced in this economy is one unit. This is one way. Or otherwise, if you divide by the number of laborers, you obtain unit out per unit of labor. I will assume the labor of one is one unit, and I will call small k the capital laboration, which is, this is the value of capital per unit of labor. Okay? These are all definitions. Now let's look at this nice trick. And the main product goes either to wages, in this case only one wage, because there's only one wage per unit, or to interest and capital. So it must be, go to the rate of interest times the value of capital. So we have this identity, y equals w plus rk. And from this we can derive k. k is y minus w divided by r. Right? So, if we are given y, w, and r, and this requires that we have the wage curve, we can derive the value of capital. And it's very simple, as you see, graphically. Because, what is this? y minus w is y, this segment, minus w, this segment, therefore it's this segment here. You see? And r is this segment here, because r is this segment. Okay? So, y minus w divided by r is the trigonometric tangent of this angle. You see? So this angle tells you immediately the value of capital. <coughs> now, First of all, this shows that if with the same wage curve, in other words, with the same technical coefficients, you change r, then the angle changes. For example, if this were the point, the angle would be much narrower, because by connecting to this point, the angle would be much narrower. So, unless the wage curve is a straight line, with given technical coefficients, the value of capital is going to change. Further confirmation, we cannot take it as given. But now let's see what happens if we have technical substitution, many different possibilities to produce. Okay, and this takes a little bit of time, let's see whether I can make it. <clears throat> First of all, if we can produce goods with many different methods, then we can build many wage curves. For each technique, that is, for each combination of methods one curve in the street, we can derive the wage curve and put all the curves in the same diagram. Once you have the same numerator. And the fundamental result is the following. Tendency of firms to minimize average cost will push firms to change methods, as long as another method allows to produce a less cost. But then prices will change to the new minimum. If at these prices firms discover there is still some other method which allows them to produce a lesser cost, they will again change method, and all this process converges. Converges to choice of techniques that brings you to the outer end of the wage pairs. This is an example of many wage pairs and the outside bits. Oops. The outside would be the outer envelope. Now, the point is that we can apply 
that way of determining the value of capital to the outer envelope. In other words, suppose you start from r equal to zero. Then this would be the chosen technique. And as long as r gets to this point, this is the chosen technique. And then along this curve, we can determine the value of capital, and the angle you see would be rather large. When R moves to a point where another wage curve is on the outer envelope, this means firms prefer another technique, and then we have to determine the value of capital by looking at the intercept here, along this new curve. And therefore, there are discontinuous changes in the value of capital. And because there are also intersections, you can have something like this. Suppose for simplicity only two wage curves, then uh, until R is less than R1, you choose the straight one. When it is in between R1 and R2, you choose the curved one. And then beyond R2, you go back to choosing the straight one. And it has been shown in many numerical examples that this is a perfectly possible case. Now, on the right hand diagram, you see what happens to the value of capital. Remember, uh, up here R is on the vertical axis, it's always done in usually in economics, the price of the factor is on the vertical axis. So when R is zero, we are on a straight line, and you see, as R increases, the value of capital does not change. When you go to the curved one, the value of capital starts, jumps discontinuously, it's less than R. When you are precisely at R1, you can use either technique, and therefore by using them in whatever combination, you can have any one along this horizontal segment. Then, because this is a concave curve, as R increases, the angle that determines the value of capital slowly increases. So this is why this is up or sloping. But when you get to R2, the jump is in the opposite direction. The jump is R increases beyond R2, the value of capital increases. Because you've gone back, to the straight line where the intercept is higher. So you see what's happening here? At R2, the switch, when the rate of interest increases, is against the neoclassical beliefs. The rate of interest has increased, the value of capital has increased. And this can happen even worse with more complicated things. Look, this is the same as the other graph, but with many wage curves. And on the right hand side, you see what's happening to the value of capital per unit of labor. As you can see, the shape is totally non neoclassical It has nothing to do with the usual standard uh, shape or supposed for the demand for capital. And because investment is connected with the demand for capital, this means there is no reason to believe that as the rate of interest decreases, investment will increase. And so we get to the Fundamental result, go to the fourth bit of this slide. So there is no reason to believe that rate of interest can bring investment to adjust the full employment savings. And now we get to macroeconomics. The victory of monetarism in the debate on Keynesian economics was based on a false theory of investment and behind it of capital. So you see, ah, yes, a little addition. Modern general equilibrium theory and dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models that you will definitely be studying simply assume that investment adapts to full employment savings with no justification. Simply, they are based on faith. Faith that neoclassical theory is somehow correct. We need another theory. Now, what can we turn to? Well, we do have another theory. The resumption of the classical or surplus approach. Its problem with value theory, the in, imperfect labor theory of value, as I argued earlier, has been surmounted. Now we know how to determine relative prices, and this approach can be combined with a Keynesian approach, free of its neoclassical elements. And this Keynesian approach will tell us that investment depends on expected growth of demand and on innovations. And savings adjust to investment through changes of the level of income. 
It's the level of income that changes if you adjust savings to investment, which is the standard area of Keynes, which Keynes, however, combined with neoclassical survivals, which allowed them to monitor the counter-offensive. And so, employment, I have two more minutes, uh, will depend on aggregate demand. And I want to stress very much this point. In the neoclassical approach works also like, um, how do you call it, uh, blinkers. You know what blinkers are? Paravanchi. Okay? Blinkers allow you not to see what's really going on outside you. And the neoclassical approach, with its insistence and need that you have given a balance of factors, makes people blind to the enormous flexibility of production in real economies. In real economies, you can easily have a growth rate that jumps from 1% per year to 10, 12, 15% a year if you were underutilizing capacity. But capacity is always at least partially underutilized because firms do not work at night. Firms only work a certain number of hours a day. You could easily work one hour more per day. And you can produce more. Why? Because initially, you use inventory of the circulating capital goods. The fixed capital goods, you simply use them more, longer time. And the circulating capital goods, you simply produce them more because you consume them initially, but then you rapidly reconstitute it precisely by producing more. And so there's this great adaptability of production to demand, which means that if simply aggregate demand is greater, production will be greater. Why do you think in China production is growing 10, 15 percent a year? Because demand is growing. And why in Europe production is not growing? Because demand has been stopped by these uh, European arrangements of which I think Professor Cesarato will perhaps tell us something. And so uh, the supply side view of growth is radically wrong. If you are interested, I have some hints about this in this paper on my webpage called uh, Neglected Implication of Capital Labor Substitution. On my webpage, you find lots of uh, things. I will more uh, discursive but more detailed evolution, uh, explanation of evolution of capital theory is in also my webpage called Capital Theory Synthetic Introduction. And then I have many chapters of provisional textbook I am putting forth. And so, uh, yes, may I recommend that you read collective political aspects of full employment? which suggests the government sometimes consciously recreate unemployment because capitalism needs unemployment to maintain well as we. And uh, then just a statement at the end. Uh, you should read a book uh, edited by Professor Cesarato here on the situation of Europe, available on the internet, called Oltre l'austerità, where he shows, he and many other professors, show that there is reason to think that the Euro system has been consciously conceived as a way to increase unemployment, weaken labor, and reduce the welfare state. Thanks.